Hey, can we just say thank you to the team this morning for uh, leading us so well? And yeah, it's quite a bit of work uh, to put this together and do that, but what a cool experience on a welcome home Sunday to be able to just worship together like this, and, and uh, what an incredible thing. So welcome home. It's great to have you with us. If you're just joining us, we are in week number two right now of a series called Field Guide for a Follower. And essentially what we're talking about is how do you spot a true follower of Jesus? Like if you were to see one out in the world, how would you know? What would be the markers be? How would you spot a true follower of Jesus in the world we live in? And so I want to begin today, uh, if I could, by talking about one of my personal heroes. So I'm going to nerd out a little bit here for a moment, but how many of you know who this is? Raise your hand if you know who this is. Okay, most of you in this room know who he is. If you don't know who this is, this is Bob Ross. Bob Ross was a painter who had his own TV show, his own painting show called The Joy of Painting. And I'm guessing most of you who raised your hand just now, you know who he is. You probably know who he is because of like YouTube. He has blown up and become like an internet celebrity on YouTube. Episodes of his show, The Joy of Painting, have like millions and millions of views. There's this whole generation of people who have discovered him and who are into him. I actually do not know Bob Ross from YouTube. I know Bob Ross because I used to watch his show as a kid on PBS every single day. I was just mesmerized by this guy. I would watch him paint. He would, you know, paint these beautiful landscapes in 30 minutes or less, you know, and the whole time saying these phrases like, happy little trees, and there are no mistakes, just happy accidents. You know, things like this. And um, I, I, just, I don't know what it was, if it was like the paintings themselves or if it was the fact that he was a white guy with a perfect afro <laughs> or if it was something about the softness of his voice. I don't know what it was, but I was just mesmerized. To make it even better, Bob Ross actually filmed every episode of his show, The Joy of Painting, right up the road from where I lived in Muncie, Indiana. This little tiny studio. I've actually been to that studio where he filmed in, in all those episodes. And what's interesting about Bob Ross, a lot of people don't know, he dropped out of high school when he was in ninth grade. And he went to work for his dad as a carpenter. He was very lost, didn't know what he was going to do with his life. And during that time with his dad, he cut the tip of his index finger off in an accident. But you actually never saw that on the show because of the way he would hold the palate. You could never see that he was missing part of a finger. From there, at 18 years old, he joined the military. He went to Alaska with the Air Force, and he was in the Air Force for 20 years in Alaska. He rose to the rank of Master Sergeant. He literally, Bob Ross, spent more time in his life yelling and screaming at people in the military than he ever did as a painter with his own TV show. <laughs> well, in fact, I saw an interview once with Bob, and he said uh, in this interview that he said, while I was in the military, I made this decision one day. I got so sick of yelling and screaming, he said, I decided if I ever got out of the military, I was never going to yell or raise my voice again. And if you've ever watched his show, you know, you can't even imagine this guy yelling. You just can't even imagine it. He completely just lived into that. He's a guy who, uh, when you watch his show, it's amazing. It's the exact same thing over and over and over again. He wore that exact same outfit for every single episode. He kept the same hairstyle for years and years and years. And he did all the same things. Like, you knew it was coming. He'd hit the brush. Oh, beat the devil out of it. He'd say all the same things, all the same phrases. Every single episode, it was exactly the same. And yet, even today... Years after his death, he, he has this whole new audience of, of people who have discovered him and who are, you know, watching his, his episodes of his show that go way beyond what he accomplished in his 52 years of life. So the question is, why? <laughs> why this guy? What, what in the world is it about him that, that makes us so fascinated? I have a theory. You want to hear my theory? Well, you're going to hear it whether you want to hear it or not. So here we go. Uh, <laughs> My theory of why we're so fascinated with Bob Ross and why we still watch his show is because the art was not just about the paintings. The actual art was watching Bob paint the paintings. That was the real art. It was performance art. That's what it was. At the end of every one of Bob Ross's episodes, you don't think to yourself, I want that painting. What you think to yourself is, I want that guy's joy of painting. Watching Bob work was the work of art. It was like he was born to do that. 
I bet you every single one of us in this room at some point in our lives have had a for now job. In other words, it's a job that it's not where you want to be long term. It's not your permanent vocation, but you've thought to yourself, maybe it was a part time job. Maybe you're in one right now, but it was, it's for now. For now, this will get me by. This will get me where I want to go. And I bet you every one of us in this room also has known someone, at least one person in our lives, that when we watch them at their job, when we watch them work, we thought, man, they were born to do this. They were created by God to do what they are doing. That was why they were made. So I'd love if we could just kind of fill in this blank. Go ahead to that next slide. How would you fill in this blank? I work so I can what? What would you put in that blank? For some of you, maybe you would put, I work so I can eat and live indoors, right? That's important. And we all know that. But, but oftentimes we think about work as like a means to an end, don't we? I, I do this so that I can have this, or I do this so I can experience this or, you know, live into this. Work is always a, a means to an end in the way we think of it. But what I want to ask today, the question I want to raise for what we're talking about is, is it possible that work is not just a means to an end. What if work itself is actually holy? What if work itself is actually sacred? What if work is actually part of how we honor God with our lives? That's certainly how the book of Genesis talks about it. If you go to the very beginning of the Bible to the creation story in Genesis, God creates Adam and Eve and places them in the Garden of Eden and everything is the way God imagined it to be. And everything in creation is good. And what it says is that Adam has work, man has work in the garden. In Genesis 2.15, it says, God created man, placed him in the garden, and gave him work to take care of it. So there's work in the original creation. It's part of God's design that man would have work that would bring him meaning and fulfillment and purpose. I actually, personally, I I think that we're going to have work in heaven someday. Revelation 21 talks about how heaven, the eternal kingdom of God is going to be this restored creation. And so if there was work in the original creation, I believe we're going to have work in the restored creation. There will be something for us to do. There will be meaning and purpose and fulfillment to our work, even even in eternity in heaven. I like what Eugene Peterson said. He's an author and theologian. He said, it's the devil's work to make us think our work is not sacred or holy. See, we have this crazy idea that like there's some of us who have like a religious job, a sacred job, a holy job, and then there's everybody else, which is the most unbiblical thing in the whole world. That is the craziest idea at all. There is no such thing as some jobs that are religious and sacred and holy and other jobs that are just eh, everybody else does those. There is holiness to our work. Paul actually talks about this to the Thessalonian church. If you're just joining us, what we're going to be doing through this series is we're journeying with the church in Thessalonica. Paul wrote the book of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. We believe it's actually the first Pauline epistles. It was the first letters that he wrote to any church. And he wrote these letters to this church about how do you actually spot a true follower of Jesus? How do you be a true follower of Jesus? And so last week we began, we said one way you can spot a true follower of Jesus is they hold on to the gospel. Even in the midst of when they're being squeezed by the culture around them, they hold on to the gospel. And another thing that Paul says we're going to look at today, one way you can spot a true follower of Jesus is in the way that they work. There's something about followers of Jesus that when in the way that they work, in the way that they engage their job, even if it's just a for now job, there's supposed to be something different. Man, there's something different about him. There's something different about her. The way that that they engage their work is supposed to stand out. Let's take a look. This is uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul says these words, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we give you this command in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay away from all believers who live idle lives and don't follow the tradition they received from us. For you know that you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. We never accepted food from anyone without paying for it. We worked hard day and night so we would not be a burden to any of you. We certainly had the right to ask you to feed us, but we wanted to give you an example to follow. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. 
Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. There's something that we see in this passage as we look at it. Go ahead to that next slide. There's this idea that there is dignity to work. There's there's a dignity to work. This is why people struggle when they can't find work. It's not just about money and provision, eating and living indoors. It's about purpose. It's about dignity. All of us need that, whether it's blue collar, white collar, religious, secular, however you want to divide these things up, all work has dignity. All work has this sense of of dignity. I was thinking this week as I was preparing this message about how oftentimes when my boys get in, when they get in trouble, when they do something they're not supposed to, my wife and I will make work a punishment, right? Like we'll say, you guys are in trouble now, you're going to have to do more chores. My car needs washing and we send them out to do work. And I've wondered like, am I teaching them the wrong thing? Am I actually teaching them that work is some sort of a punishment? To to work and to want to work is is like some kind of horrible thing that could happen to you. Don't worry, I'm still going to give them chores when they mess up. There's no no break they're getting for that. But I wonder sometimes work actually, when work is doing good, like Paul was saying, never get tired of doing good. When work is doing good in the world, when it is bringing a sense of dignity and purpose to us, it is not a burden. It's not a punishment. It's a joy. It's a joy. Like Bob Ross, it's a, it's a joy to actually do our work when we find that. And uh, if you look at the world that Paul was speaking to, the Thessalonian world was a very Greek world, uh, that town specifically. In the Greco-Roman world, they would actually look down on anybody who worked with their hands. So any kind of manual labor, they actually frowned upon it. They thought it was kind of low. And the reason for that is because uh, they, they emphasized intellectualism so highly. They valued that so highly in the Greco-Roman world. And so what would happen is there would be people who would live idle lives, as Paul is talking about here in this passage. And what he's talking about is people who would sit in the public square, and they would sit around in, in the public square debating ideas and philosophies and religions. And this is what they, they would do all day long, and they sort of frowned upon people who actually worked with their hands. In fact, people like Paul who would have traveled around with ideas and and gone to the public places and would have spoken about these philosophies and ideas and religions, oftentimes they would be supported by a wealthy patron. That was a common thing in that society that you would have some kind of wealthy patron behind somebody like Paul who would go around and who would support them as they went around and delivered their ideas in the public forums. And what Paul is saying in this passage is he's saying, not me. That's not how I'm living. There's no wealthy patron standing behind me. Paul is saying, I work. In fact, uh, we, what we know about Paul is that he was a tent maker in the area of Damascus. He came from a family where that's what they did. And so he, he was a tent maker. He worked with his hands. And he was speaking to the idea that there is dignity to work. There is dignity to working with our hands and to making a living. But he doesn't just affirm the dignity of work. What he goes a step further to do is he says, there's actually supposed to be something different about the way in which we work. If you're a follower of Jesus, there's something different about the way you work. Look at this. This is um, 1 Thessalonians 4. He says this, make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others. I'm going to read that last sentence again because that's the why. He gives us the why in that last sentence. Then people who are not believers will respect the way that you live, and you will not need to depend on other people. For Paul, if he was going to fill in that blank that we that we looked at just a few minutes ago, the way Paul would fill it in is, I work so I can impact others for the kingdom. I work so that I can impact other people for the kingdom of God. I'm a tent maker second. I'm a builder of the kingdom of God first. That's my vocation. That's my calling. 
what begins to happen is, is this shift begins to happen in our lives. As we begin to put Jesus first in our lives, as we begin to follow him, uh, what happens is this, this thing happens. Our relationship with work actually begins to change and begins to, begins to shift, and we engage our work differently. And there's a couple of evidences of, of what it looks like when these shifts begin to happen in our lives and work begins to take on a new relationship. Uh, go ahead to that next slide. Uh, work in the world is my value comes from my work. That's how most of us engage our jobs, our work. We have this sense, my value, especially in the West, in America, my value comes from my work. My value comes from what I do. And so my identity, my status, all of that comes from my work. This is why when people lose their jobs, it's such a personal uh, disruption in life because my value comes from that. But what happens is as we begin to go through this shift, work in the kingdom is my work actually comes from my value. My work is actually just an outflow of my value. So work can't touch my value because my value is gifted me. My identity is gifted me of, of no work on my own by Jesus, by what he did for me on the cross. And now I'm adopted as a son, as a daughter, as a child of God. And my value is secure. Work has nothing to do with my value. My value is secure in who he is and who he says I am. And so what happens is work then is sort of set free of all this anxiety that we put on it. And work just becomes an outflow of what I do of, of, or an outflow of my value of who I am. Another shift that begins to happen, the evidence of it as we begin to take this step, work in the world is I use people to get more work done. So you think about it. Yeah, that's oftentimes how we think about clients, how we think about people that we're selling to in a sales job. I use people to get more work done, my employees, whoever it is. So it's all about me. It's about me elevating my platform. I use people in order to get more done for me. And so we work relationships to that end. But what happens as my value is not determined by my work and by the value that work places on me and my value is in Christ, as that shift begins to happen, what happens is work in the kingdom becomes I use work in order to get people rescued. Instead of I use people to get my work done, it's I use work in order to see more people be rescued by Jesus. Work just becomes the avenue, the door. I'm a tent maker second. I'm a builder of the kingdom of God first. What I do just opens the door so that more and more people can come to know Jesus. So to flesh this out a little bit, if you own a company in this room, your company that you own can actually work against the kingdom of God coming more fully into this world. Or you could actually lead a company in such a way that your clients, your employees, everybody that you interact actually gets a taste of the kingdom of God through how you lead your company. They actually can become to see the kingdom of God through the way that you work. If you are a stay-at-home mom, by the way, the last couple of weeks I've heard two different stay-at-home moms say, uh, actually, yeah, I'm not working right now. Seriously? You are working harder than everybody else if you're a stay-at-home mom. C.S. Lewis actually said there's only one real vocation and all the other vocations in life just help to support that one vocation, which is staying at home with kids and raising them. Uh, so you're a stay-at-home mom. You drive a minivan to the soccer matches and you bake cupcakes for the second grade class and you try to make it to Fit Body Boot Camp once a week. Okay, once a month. And, uh, and, and you're living this life and it feels like you're not working. But if you engage that place in life for, as an agent of the kingdom of God, what it means is you have been sent to the soccer players and their families. You've been sent to the young families in your neighborhood that are a part of the elementary school with you. And you have been sent to the people you sweat with once a week at Fit Body Boot Camp. See, it, it, the point is any job we have can have purpose if we engage it as an agent of the kingdom of God. Because my value doesn't come from my work. My work is just an expression. It's an outflow of who Jesus already made me to be, of who God says I am. So I don't work. I don't use people in order to get my work done. I use my work in order to help more and more people become rescued. My first job I ever had, uh, I serviced a couple of pop machines. Um, I was 14 years old, and my father was the manager of a credit union in the town we lived in. And so 
Uh, he, he basically thought at 14, Brian, I'm, I want to teach my son business principles. I want to get him a job and teach him so he can grow up and he can go into business just like me. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> but uh, uh, what he did is he, there were these two pop machines in the lobby of the credit union where he worked. And so he purchased both of those pop machines. And he basically said, I'm going to teach you supply and demand. I'm going to teach you how to actually service these pop machines and find the best deal. And then you can keep and pocket whatever profit you make. And so what happened is I, my dad would drive me in, and, and while he was there at work, and I would spend time every week there at uh, the credit union. And so I, it was this incredible gift because I got to watch my dad at work. And my dad was great at his job. I mean, really great. When I was there, nobody knew me as Brian. That wasn't my name while I was there at the credit union. I was Norm's son. That's how everybody knew me. And, oh, aren't you Norm's son? That's how everybody talked to me. And I remember watching my dad with his employees. I, I remember watching the way he talked to them and the way he treated them. And he was just great. I remember going into his office and uh, listening to him as he would finish up a phone call and just listening to how he would talk to people and deal with people on the phone. He was just so good at his job. And at 14, I remember I had this epiphany. There was kind of this aha moment for me. And what, what it was is I would go to his job and I would watch him at work and how great he was. And then we would get in the car and drive the 10 to 15 minutes home to our house. And I remember thinking to myself, my dad knows what he is doing at work. He knows exactly what to do. But when we would get home and oftentimes I would think to myself, oh, he, he doesn't know what to do at home. I think my dad was like a lot of us men in that way. I don't think he really knew how to connect with my mom or my sister and my brother and I a lot of times. And so work became the pursuit of his life. It became the thing. I think for a lot of, especially men, I think what happens is, you know, we don't necessarily know what to do sometimes in all these other areas of life, but it's like, I know what to do at work. I know how to make that go. And so we go after that with everything we've got. We, do, we pour everything into it and it becomes the thing that defines us. But work can never fully satisfy. It can never fully give us what we're looking for. And so I, I remember um, watching my dad and seeing this sort of disconnect between home and work. What's interesting is if you go to the original story in the book of Genesis, the symbol that God gives in the book of Genesis for work losing its purpose is thorns. I told you in Genesis 2, God creates man and he puts him in the garden to work it and take care of it. Work has purpose, it has meaning. But then in chapter 3, sin enters the world and the world becomes fractured and broken. And so God curses not the man. God doesn't curse the man with work. What he does is God curses the ground. And in Genesis 3:18, it says the curse is that the ground, you'll work the ground, but it will only yield thorns for you. Thorns will come up instead of grain. And so thorns became a symbol of the curse. Every time you interact with it, that's, that's part of the curse. So work, you're, you're going to work. You're going to throw yourself into your job, but it won't deliver that ultimate sense of meaning and purpose that you want it to. There's, there will be a deep restlessness to work now. There will be a deep exhaustion and it will never quite give you that sense of meaning and fulfillment that you're looking for. What's amazing is the gospel writers, when they, the details that they give when they recount the crucifixion story of Jesus, there's this symbol when Jesus is held in captivity by the Roman soldiers and they begin to torture Jesus, they do something, they, they twist together a crown of... And they take these thorns, and, and thorns are pounded into Jesus' skull until the blood begins to flow. And symbolically, what the gospel writers are hoping we're going to see is Jesus is actually taking on himself the curse that was meant for us. The punishment and the brokenness of the world that was meant for us, Jesus is actually taking it upon himself. He is actually taking what was meant for us in our place, in his death on the cross. And so when we believe in Jesus, when we put our trust and our faith in Jesus, we receive from him grace and love and forgiveness without working for it. Because it was his work, his finished work on the cross that dealt with the curse, that paid for our sin, and that gives us meaning and purpose again. If you try to work your way into heaven, if you try to work your way into God's good graces, 
if you create a checklist and just, I'm going to try to do more good things than I do bad things, you will find yourself endlessly exhausted and totally a failure. You're only going to get thorns. That's all you can get. But, but if you receive Jesus as Lord, what happens is you begin to rest in him. Your, your value doesn't come from your work. Your work is just an outflow of your value. And you rest in him and, and you believe what he says about you. And that begins to transform you. It begins to change you. And so you turn with that new awareness. And now the way you engage your work is your work is no longer about you. Your work is now about him. And it's about others that he has sent you to, to be a light to. And when that happens, any job can begin to be, have meaning and purpose in our lives. I watched that exact transformation happen with my dad. During those years while I was in high school, I, I watched what happened as he began to, to make that shift and that change with Jesus. And so all of this effort and work and anxiety he was putting on work suddenly went away and he was a different person. And he engaged his work, his family differently. And a big reason why I'm standing right here today doing what I'm doing with my life is because it transformed me. The way we work, the way we engage our work is a spiritual issue. It's a, it's a matter between our hearts and God. So I want to invite you to do something. Would you stand uh, with me? This is Welcome Home Sunday. And field guide for a follower, we're talking about what is a real follower of Jesus. One of the things a real follower of Jesus does, real followers of Jesus invite other people to be real followers of Jesus. And so I, I'd love to just give you an opportunity right now. Maybe for some of you in this room, you've been running after work. You've been running after something to give you a sense of meaning and purpose and fulfillment and all you're getting is thorns. It's not delivering. There's a deep exhaustion. This morning, do you need to transfer that debt to the person of Jesus? He took the thorns on your behalf so you could be given a new life in him. So I wonder, do some of you just need to come to this place where you say, I'm going to stop fighting. I'm going to surrender to Jesus. I'm going to let him have it all. I'm going to let him define who I am. And then I'm going to turn and I'm going to, my work is just going to be an outflow of that. Would you bow your heads with me? If that's you this morning, if you say, I know it's time, I need to take that step, would you just raise your hand? Would you say, oh, that's me today. That's me, awesome, praise God. Keep your hands up. Oh, man, wow. Praise God, praise God. I want you to pray with me right now if you just if you raised your hand. You can use your own words, you can use my words. Lord Jesus, I come to you now and I confess you as Lord of my life. I recognize that you took the punishment that was meant for me. And so I, I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me, and to come and fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me a new life in you, a new identity in you. God, I, I will stop striving to find my value in the world and in my work and what the world says I am. And today I take on this new identity of you as a child of God that I am whole, I am redeemed, I am restored and reconciled by your death and your resurrection. I believe that you've made me a new person. And now, Lord, I ask you to show me how you want me to live, how you want me to work. Show me how to live out of that value of who you've called me to be. And I pray that you would give meaning and purpose into my life as I make it about you and your kingdom. I ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said.